scholarship. And so I think this conversation is extremely timely. So we're going to go ahead and first talk about the AMP project. And we're grateful to have some of the students with us as well as the faculty mentors. So let me go ahead and do those introductions. So we have Dr. Yuki Akubo, who holds her PhD in counseling psychology from Columbia University. She's an assistant professor of psychology at SU. She's trained as both a researcher and a clinician. Her research focuses on racism and coping, experiences of the marginalized, mentoring of students of color, social justice issues, and qualitative inquiries. Her racism and coping research lab has been conducting qualitative inquiry on how people talk about race, racism, racial identity, and race relations. And they have developed and recently implemented an anti-racism 101, starting a race dialogue, a peer-led two-hour workshop for SU undergrad students. She's co-director of the Accelerated Mentor Mentoring Program in the Psychology Department with Dr. Michelle Schleyhofer. She received a University System of Maryland Women's Forum Faculty Research Award in 2018, a 2020 Fulton School Faculty Research Mentor Award, and very recently, the 2021 President's Diversity Champion Award. Fantastic. Along with Professor Akubo is Professor Michelle Schleyhofer, who holds a PhD in Applied Social Psychology from Claremont Graduate University. She's a professor of psychology at SU. She has training in applied community-based participatory action research approaches, and her work lies at the intersection of action research, public policy, advocacy, and activism. She is evaluator of SU's Safe Spaces Training Program, a board member of the nonprofit PFLAG Salisbury Inc., which she founded in 2015. She received a 2017 USM Board of Regents Faculty Award in Public Service and a 2019 Distinguished Faculty Award. She's co-director of the Accelerated Mentoring Program and co-directs the REACH initiative with Dr. Tim Stock in Philosophy which we'll hear about in our second piece. She currently is co-editing a special issue of the flagship peer-reviewed journal on public psychology, The American Psychologist. So thank you so much, Professors Akubo and Schleyhofer and your students. If you like, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, hope everyone can hear us. Mm -hmm. Hi, good to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know it's a very um, busy time of the year, so we appreciate your presence and the support in coming here and joining us today. Um, so we're gonna talk about accelerated mentoring program that is in the Department of Psychology. And we wanted to provide a little bit of a background. So um, psychology program has increasingly attracted a greater um, proportions of students of color in line with national trends. And there is a need to diversify student cohorts who move into graduate training um, in the field of psychology. Students of color attending predominantly white institutions known as uh, PWIs desire greater cultural fit in training programs that align with their values, which are more inclined to be social justice oriented. And we have conducted a study in our department to that echoes this prior work, where the students of color expressed the desire for a space centering them and more and deeper connections with faculty and a more concrete career advice and guidance. And that has really led us to really um, think about how we can create a um, scaffolding mentoring program that will really um, help students of color and students who are interested in social justice issues to actually um, learn about field of psychology and potentially pursue field of psychology. So um, Dr. Schleyhofer and I had applied for first year seed grant um, from the APA Office of Ethnic Minority Affairs um, that 
had this um, initiative called the Commission on the Ethnic Minority Recruitment Retention and Training Grant. So this is essentially a seed grant to support programs like AMP, um, providing um, some fundings to get it started. And so we received that grant from APA and um, Fulton School of Liberal Arts Dean's Office has also matched us and um, we've been able to get started this academic year. And um, fortunately for the second year, um, the Dean's Office as well as the Provost Office have committed to um, providing us funding for the fiscal year of 2021 to 2022. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the AMP program. So AMP stands for Accelerated Mentoring Program and it seeks to address these concerns um, that I have mentioned previously. If you're a two-year tailored bridge program for students interested in social justice issues who are majoring in psychology. Students qualify if they're a sophomore or junior majoring in psychology, they're interested in social justice and anti-racism, and they're interested in graduate school. We have recruited 10 students um, for both year 20, 20 to 21 and 2021 to 2022. So these are our phenomenal um, students of this academic year, Blessing Ajay, um, Giselle Canales, Slade Orbus, who is with us, um, Brilan Day, Ramona Hardin, Jaquan Jackson, who's also with us, Sebastian Mantua, um, Isaiah Myers, Janaya Autumn, and Allison Rivera. Um, half of them are actually graduating in a few weeks. 2021 to 2022 cohort. So these are the students that we recently recruited to um, join us for the next academic year, along with the um, this year's um, students who are not graduating yet. So Trevor Clark, Ryan Devine, um, Kirsten Dixon, Ethan Lacey, Stefan Mason, Ria McCormick, Jaden Messer, um, Zoe Moreno, Gabrielle Swilly, and Rochelle Watson. So now that we have um, AMP running, um, there are some specific goals that we had delineated um, in the hope that um, we would be able to foster not only an environment that the students were looking for, but also to provide them with some um, knowledge and skills. So the first goal is increasing um, interest in obtaining a postgraduate degree in psychology. Goal two, solidify career and educational goals for students interested in social justice and anti-racism issues. Goal three, increasing academic motivation, self-regulation, critical consciousness, and a career decision-making self-efficacy. Goal four, providing the necessary skills and research experiences to make AMP participants competitive for psychology graduate school programs, focusing on social justice and anti-racism research, teaching and professional practice. Goal number five, providing opportunities to connect with professional mentors, working on social justice and anti-racism topics in psychology, and have the opportunity to receive strong letters of recommendation by psychologists affiliated with the program. Goal number six, increasing sense of belonging in the Department of Psychology at SU. Goal number seven, providing opportunities to mentor adolescents in the community in the development of a social justice oriented research project. Your AMP participants can provide an environment where youth develop career and educational goals. And last but not least, goal number eight, providing a structure in which adolescent youth are exposed to college student role models and are exposed to basics about psychology and its application to social justice and are encouraged to attend college with a clear understanding of what college experience may offer them. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the current program structure and our weekly schedule. So um, the program is structured in such a way that AMP students take a community community-based participatory action research course over fall term. And then we meet weekly with youth mentees via Zoom um, due to pandemic, meet with psychology scholars for um, mentorship via Zoom. And that is partly because many of them are actually not from this area. 
um, discussed professional development topics and um, developed documents such as curriculum vitae, personal statements, etc. So how that maps into our weekly schedule um, for this academic year was um, on Mondays, we had professional development in the CEPR course. On Tuesdays, we met with um, AMP youth, um, mentees in the community via Zoom. And on Wednesdays, um, we discussed um, CEPR and community counseling psychology content in class. On Thursdays, we met with AMP mentors, um, psychologists of color. And on Fridays, we often did check-ins and individual small group mentorings um, on the projects that they were working on. Hi, so I'm going to take over. So thanks for having me. Um, and so what you're looking at now is, is the mentors that we brought in. So as Dr. Kubo said, we brought in some scholars of color representing various disciplines in psychology. We brought in three mentors in the fall 2020 semester and four in the spring 2021 semester. Um, they were a mix of community and social psychologists, counseling psychologists, and, um, and, and, I, and IO psychologists. And uh, these mentors uh, talked about their personal experiences navigating um, their own pathways into graduate programs and into professional settings. They provided some um, peer mentorship, answered students' questions, and um, gave them a, a more personal experience about uh, what it's like to be a student of color at both the undergraduate and the graduate level, and then transitioning into professional programs. You can go ahead with the next slide. Um, so in terms of the student outputs, as you heard, we were very busy with the students over the, the course of the entire academic year. Um, and this resulted in several um, outputs, both in terms of the type of scholarly activities the students engaged in and then the professional development activities. So in terms of the scholarly activities, we did work with the AMP students and youth mentees to um, kind of identify what their interests were in social justice topics and break them up into teams. And each team worked on a, a unique uh, community participatory action research project of their own design. And the topics, just to give you an indicator of what the students were interested in, um, entailed racial stereotypes in social media, the uh, local recycling, particularly of plastics throughout the state of Maryland, awareness of individuals suffering from homelessness, and the impact of incarceration on families and communities. And from these projects, um, the students ended up doing, uh, collecting their own, designing their own study, collecting their own data, and they gave um, four presentations accepted at two national conferences, the Association for Women in Psychology and the Winter Roundtable at Teachers College Conference. Um, each of the students had at least one conference presentation. Uh, some of them had two. And uh, all of the students also presented at the SUSRC conference here on campus uh, last week or two weeks ago. Um, in terms of the last week, <laughs> in terms of the professional development, um, all of the students came out of the AMP program with a current CV, including uh, conference presentations, a professional statement and career plan of what they intend to do in the future. And they also explored subfields in the discipline of psychology and scholars, uh, particularly scholars of color, that they would be potentially interested in working with in the future. And the student mentoring, for instance, has covered um, various topics, including how to get into graduate school, the application process, career and identity exploration, and linking that to uh, one's personal values and, and not only their professional goals. And also, we spent a lot of time um, working with the students on how to navigate white institutions and address uh, racism and, and micro, both microaggressions and systemic racism that students um, are going to experience as they work in white institutions. Go ahead with the next slide. Um, so I just want to turn it over to our two students, Soleil Darbuz and Jaquan Jackson. They both worked on the recycling project with local youth, and they uh, want to share a few of their thoughts on their experiences this year. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Oh, my name is Jaquan Jackson. And before I even get started, I want to shout out Dr. O and Dr. S for even creating the program, for like starting it and letting me be a part of it. And to just to discuss my experience with the youth with the AMP program, it was uh, truly exciting to meet the younger generation and to see how intelligent they were, to see how much, like, just to see the growth of like 
so many of them that I wasn't that sophisticated that young. So it was a truly humbling experience. Uh, and then they worked on my interpersonal skills, uh, speaking with the mentors that they brought to the sessions and just to get the more insight, more insightful information on topics that I wasn't even aware of, of graduate schools or programs in general, because there's so many different fields of psychology that I wasn't even aware of. So it made me do a deeper depth into looking into graduate school. So that leads into my next bullet point, obtain information on graduate school. Uh, I didn't even know a CV was required. I didn't even know what a CV was. <laughs> so when that was uh, brought to my attention, yeah. Yeah, it helped a lot. <laughs> That's all I got. Hi, I'm Soleil. I know my internet went out, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I just want to say that I've been, this experience with AMP has been so rewarding. I'm so glad I joined this program. Um, working with the youth has been um, great to say, because like, I feel like over time they've they've opened up and slowly like came out of their shell and talked to us more. Um, uh, it was really nice seeing their perspectives on like different topics as well. And like slowly seeing them be more interactive with us as well. Um, this program has allowed me to gain more research experience uh, with, while bringing me out of my comfort zone as well by presenting at conferences, facilitating discussions. Um, my mentors in this program have helped to shape my leadership skills as well through the ability of being a mentor to the, to the youth and being able to adapt to changes fast and improvising and having to make decisions for our group as far as like research plans and all of that. Um, being in this program has also provided me with more insight on the career field I wanna go into because after undergrad, I want to be um, a clinical psychologist and get my, uh, my PhD or my PsyD. I'm still deciding, I'm not sure yet. I'm also a junior, so I have a little bit of time. I have my last year to figure that out. Um, it's helped to give me more information about what to expect in graduate school. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm just looking forward to next year and seeing where this goes. Thank you. Um, we are in the process of uh, collecting assessment data with our students to document um, output, out, output and impact of the program. Um, and we are administering surveys uh, to our students at four points in time. Um, upon entry into the program, everyone took a survey. At the end of the first semester, the end of the academic year, so they're taking one now, um, and they'll take one at one year follow-up. And on that survey, we ask about uh, career goals, about their uh, educational goals, and also about their sense of belongingness and impact of the program. Um, also, because we only have a small number of students who are using qualitative data analysis as well. Um, so with the survey with 10 people, it's kind of hard to really um, draw statistical conclusions. So we're also doing uh, focus groups with our students. They participated in one at the end of the first semester, and they are actually taking one today. Um, and those focus groups are not conducted by uh, Dr. Kubo and I. They're con conducted by uh, social work faculty that don't uh, directly work with our students so that they can share anonymous feedback. And if you go to the next slide, I actually just wanted to share some of the feedback from the students. And um, we obviously have not analyzed the data yet because we're still collecting it, but just to give you an input and um, kind of an indicator of what the types of things students are saying. And again, these are confidential, so uh, we don't know who they are, what students are saying these things, um, and they're, they're not directly sharing them with us. So it allows them an opportunity to be more honest. Um, so here's some examples. The level of exposure that they give us is phenomenal because I feel as though if I was in any other program, probably remotely close to this, I wouldn't have the type of exposure that we do to the various professors and psychologists and community psychologists that we have had the opportunity to meet and get information. It's instilled a lot of confidence in me being shown that there's people like me in this field and that I can succeed. It's nothing that I had before. And I think that speaks to the fact that representation is very important. It's really difficult to find actual programs and classes that reflects or want to reflect me as an individual and like show what I'm truly capable of. And I feel like this program did exactly that. They chose each and every one of us knowing that we were capable of doing greatness and actually had faith in us. And it kind of like, you know, makes me feel like a standout on a campus. So it just makes me feel special and I really appreciate it. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, just some more um, feedback. I like the vibe and connection we had in the classroom 
and remember this is over Zoom, so this is a virtual classroom. I like classes like this where we all have relationships and we all talk to each other, like outside of class and that like when you have classes where you don't even know people's names. They, um, the professors, Dr. Kubo and I, put their heart into this program and they put it into their teaching style and you can see that is a reflection of their, their goal here in this program. Not even you know, is nothing selfish about what they're doing for us in this class and this program. So like to know that they're honestly putting their all into it as best I can while holding themselves accountable and have something you don't really see anywhere. So we are actually uh, quite proud considering that um, with all the difficulties of teaching over Zoom and connecting with students over Zoom. And for instance, Jaquan is graduating and I've never met him in person <laughs> ever. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that it speaks volumes that students are um, having this type of experience um, in a virtual learning uh, format. You can go ahead with the next slide. Um, in terms of the course evaluation, uh, we did have them complete, obviously, the standard course evaluation of that uh, CPAR class that they took part in the fall. Here's a couple comments from that. I feel that everyone should have the opportunity at least once in their college life to be part of a group like this because it made me grow as a student and future professional incredibly. I think this course needs more visibility for the rest of the university community so that people will be interested in the results and research coming out of this group. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so that said, we actually have worked really hard to increase the visibility and promote our students. <laughs> so we have uh, put them in the uh, Fulton newsletter, the department newsletter, the alumni newsletter, the student flyer. Um, we have taken press releases with the PR office. We've taken every opportunity we could to promote our students and the work that they're doing. Um, and one thing that you can do if you haven't already is to follow uh, the AMP program on Facebook at Accelerated Mentoring Program and keep an eye out for our students. And when they approach you to work on research um, or express interest in opportunities, definitely keep them in mind and, and remember that they're coming um, really highly prepared through AMP. And of course, re recommending students to the program. So we hope to continue in future years. And thank you. And this is actually a slide from uh, at the end of the fall semester, students gave presentations on their professional growth and development and where they saw their career plans heading. And this is a slide from um, Ramona's presentation for last slide. Thank you. If you are willing to, oh great, stop the screen share. We would invite anyone to unmute themselves so we can talk a little bit. You may have questions for any of the four speakers about the program. If I may, um, I have to go. I'm sorry, I can't stay, but I did kind of wonder uh, for the students seeing some of your feedback. I think it's great that so much of this positive experience was done over Zoom given the circumstances. And uh, a study was just out uh, recently showing that there's less Zoom fatigue when people feel like they're part of a group. And I think this kind of reflects that. Um, so that's great. But I kind of want to ask the students um, based on your experience, what kind of recommendations would you have for, I guess, the psychology major and maybe the university as a whole to just create a better environment? What would you suggest? I guess I would say I really appreciated like my professors checking in, like to see if I'm, you know, doing good, especially during this time, just like worrying about our mental health and not just the assignments. I don't know. Yeah. It Depends on the professor, but I really appreciated that. Yeah, yeah. that human connection, I guess. Yeah, actually, second what Soleil said, like, uh, just the interaction, because uh, Zoom was uh, difficult for all of us, to say the least. So with the program, they uh, they always checked on us consistently before, like, work even started or before class even started, just to see how we were doing and uh, had one-on-one -on -one sessions with us just so we can, like, uh, talk our business, I guess. Yeah. Especially for the youth, it was harder for them because they're in high school. And, yeah. Uh, I guess what they're experiencing is different from what we're experiencing in college. So they had a lot of Zoom fatigue. Sometimes they didn't feel like talking. So we would have to get them out of their comfort zone and interact with them. Yeah, but not in our group, though. Our group was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were always asking them how their day went, what they yeah. did today. You know, just to get them talking and not just feel like they have to be here. Yeah. yeah. Anything else that 
would be helpful for the major that you would suggest? Um, the major, as far as like learning about graduate schools? Uh, just in general, your whole experience, you know, what, what could we as a department do to make the experience better for um, all students, but especially students of color, perhaps? Um, I heard that there was going to be a, Dr. Kubo helped me out. I heard there was going to be like a racism and coping like course that everybody's going to have to take for this major, but I'm not sure. Are you talking about the um, psychology so department major yeah. reform and we will have the multi um, the diversity requirement? Yeah. That I've actually that. recently voted on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's not just I a single like course, but it will okay. be a compilation of courses that psychology majors would be required to take. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like that really would be effective. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes with that. And I also feel like it should be for more majors too, not just psychology, but I do feel like that would be really beneficial for psychology majors. Yeah, implement more courses on different majors about race and ethnicity. Because uh, when I was at community college, I took African-American culture class and it really, uh, it opened my eyes to the history of African-American, just not what's promoted in media or like mm -hmm. and like certain portions of history classes that we don't really get to dissect too often so yeah. I think that will help a lot just not for like African Americans but for Asians and like the minority groups thank you for sure anyone else have any questions I have a, a question for the students and then maybe a question for um the advisors. So the question for the students is what, so it sounds like sometimes it was a challenge to get the youth talking. Yeah. Um, did that give you any insight or experience into like classroom environments when you're yeah. the student? And then for the, the, the faculty members, I'm curious if you can tell us some of the tips you shared with students about how to best navigate being at predominantly white institutions, because obviously SU is, and you know, so we can be thinking about ways we might be able to help support our other students. As for the like getting the youth to talk more, we were told like to do icebreakers. We had to pick different like topics to get them to want to talk. Like, oh, what's your, what hobbies do you have? So that we could kind of relate in some ways to them to get them to want to talk. So that, that was a way that we got them to talk more with a lot of icebreakers. Yeah, the icebreakers uh, helped. They were wonderful. Like, they were all fun, actually. Though. They were like a personal ones, fun ones, ones that got you to think. So yeah, the icebreakers. And it made me like really respect what teachers are doing because over Zoom, like, Seeing the high school students, yeah. like the camera will be off, no one will be saying anything. So you're just like looking at a blank screen and I can be in my room and I can just be like sit right there. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned how to you embrace the silence. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, it made me gain a whole new nobody perspective. Nobody was talking to talk to yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm thinking of the shoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the icebreaker question. So the students would come up with the icebreakers and some, some weeks the youth led them, uh, you know, so engaging the youth and having them lead in that icebreaker. Um, and just a technical thing, it actually worked really well because they would do the icebreakers while uh, Dr. Kubo was sorting people into the breakout rooms. <laughs> so it served a practical purpose just so that we weren't just staring at her doing that. Um, but the one was uh, the shoe one was just like, yeah, if you could be a shoe, like, what, would you what shoe would you be and why or something? And just people's yeah. response. Something like to get you thinking. Yeah. I think there was another one. If you could be like a kitchen supply, like, or something like that, like in the kitchen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, and the doctor owned like the yeah. air fryer. <laughs> $75. Yeah. 
we need to write those down because we're going to forget them. But like, especially yeah. towards the end of the semester, y'all were doing amazing jobs coming up with really creative icebreakers. Yeah. yeah, I think we just got more comfortable with the questions to be like building yeah, forward with each other. So it wasn't like no one felt out of place. Like it, it felt like safe. It just was a safe environment. I feel like. Yeah, to be ourselves and yeah, say anything. <laughs> yeah, literally say anything. I was a Chelsea boot, so. I <laughs> got <laughs> I'm trying to think what other questions we asked um just like where like what would you want to do like what superpower would you want some people said to travel or like to teleport so they could be able to travel the world i think dr o had said um a question about i forget what it was called so like if you wanted to like if you didn't want to work what would you do and i think you had said like just to travel and Something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was it the? Was it like if you had a million dollars, or like if you didn't have to work anymore? Like oh yeah, you yeah, yeah, your yeah. You your life, work. your life. Yeah. Yeah. Almost yeah. everyone said uh, travel. But then some people were like, I wouldn't want to travel because I'm a homebody, so I want to stay in the house. So people, some people were like half and half about that. So it definitely got them talking, like these kinds of icebreakers. So Rachel, your other question is like, what kind of conversations did we have? Um, uh, I, I think, uh, and others can jump in, but we did have a lot of conversations about navigating microaggressions, um, but also about how to change systems and the potential risks of changing systems and like, when would, you know, at, at how do you navigate that, right? So um, yeah. I think part of the problem is, is that when you're just teaching people how to avoid microaggressions. I mean, really what you're doing is like getting people to cope with a problem, right? Um, but really we want students to be change agents. So spending a lot of time talking about, you know, how to make that happen in a way that is effective, but also not jeopardizing um, to future careers and opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we talked about grad school, we spent a lot of time talking about fit um, fit with the department, fit with the program, fit with the, what's the program training you to do? And, you know, what, it, what is the mentor's approach? Um, is the mentor going to be, a, you know, an appropriate mentor for what you want? And so kind of some of those are standard conversations that we have with all students, but um, I think there is an additional layer of making sure that students, when they move into graduate programs, are, are in a program that's actually going to support them in the way that encourages students to flourish and not just survive, if that makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. I feel like it's it's difficult to pinpoint what exactly do we do with the specific um, program, but I think the overall arching approach that Michelle is mentioning about the about talking about macro level, you know, things, right? Um, how the the culture, the society, the systems, the institutions, how they affect us and how are we going to affect them, right? I think that was important. And then I think, you know, I, I do try to be transparent and also provide per, um, personal, you know, stories when it's um, effective in sharing about, you know, what I have experienced as a student of a color and a faculty of a color as I navigated various different institutions. But I think, you know, what this group of students, I think those conversations were a lot more direct. Um, I didn't have to, not that I ever sugarcoat, but like I could be very direct because, you know, we, we we're always naming things. And so there was no taboos or, you know, like we have to kind of insinuate things. We were very straightforward with them. And I think um, their mentors um, did the exact same um, without prompting. And so, you know, many of them, like they did sort of what they felt comfortable doing. So some of them had formal presentations about their personal and professional journey. Some of them just talked and answered questions and it was very kind of different but um I think what they all shared um was being really real and open to answering questions and talking about 
the difficulties, the moments that they almost quit their graduate programs or almost like, you know, like left the meeting angry or, you know, those moments and really sharing that and what that was like and how they navigated those moments. So, yeah, those are the things that kind of stands out. And we can talk more at the end of the session, if it's okay with you all, I'd like to go ahead and transition. And I neglected to point out our Dean Martin Paraboom. So thank you for joining us and thank you for continuing to sponsor this program. And thank you, Michelle and Yuki, do all the publicity you want and I'm happy to help you. I think it's, it's phenomenal and keep you know sharing the good news. Thank you. And so thank you to our students. Yes, thank you so much. It's fabulous to, to be here and, and help enlighten us. Thank yeah, you. And I have a quick, just a quick question. Do you have any plans to stay in touch? Is there anything formal about the program in terms of sort of fostering a sort of a continued interaction among the group um, looking ahead so you can continue to support each other as you go on to graduate school and do great things? That's a really good question, but we haven't like formally kind of talked about it. Um, Soleil is going to be with us for another year, as she's mentioned. Jake one's um, graduating, but we have already told him that we're not letting him go <laughs> in terms of, you know, being in touch with him. Um, but I don't think we have formalized necessarily um, how to kind of continue that. Maybe, you know, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, some, I think some of the, some of the students, um, you know, are moving into research positions. So like Soleil will be here another year and she's going to be working with um, Dr. Illig in sociology on a joint project that I'm working on with her. Um, so, and we also have the, the group, the group me text that <laughs> we can uh, continue to bug students on. <laughs> so yeah, we definitely will be keeping t in touch. I think that's something I, you know, we should talk more about um, Yuki, because I think it would be good for students Absolutely. to come back and talk to current AMP students after they you know, show them the postgraduate experience. Yeah, passing the torch too from one group to the next would be something to think about. And if you need any money for catering, just let me know. Thank you. We will. Thank you. When we can <laughs> eat in person, we're brave enough to be in person. <laughs> yeah. Coming. Very soon, right? To a campus yep. near us. So we're going to uh, talk about the REACH Community Ethics Initiative, and let me introduce you to our colleague, Dr. Timothy Stock, earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto. He's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Philosophy. As chair, he established public philosophy as the central aspect of his department's mission, and has expanded philosophy activities in the schools, assisted living communities, the local prison, art galleries, and libraries. His research interests are in social philosophy, such as the philosophy of religion, art, and literature, in particular, Levinas's face-to-face -face ethics. He's director of the Eastern Correctional Institute book discussion program and has led three public humanities grants facilitating community dialogue on mass incarceration and youth policing. He has received awards for teaching and literacy outreach. He co-directs the REACH initiative with Dr. Michelle Schlehofer with the focus on leading ethics across the curriculum efforts and translating community ethics data into course materials and campus community work sessions. So thank you both for sharing about the REACH project. Thank you. Did you want me to screen share, Tim, or did you want to? Uh, if you could screen share, that would be great. And thanks for having us. Also, congratulations to the psychology department on the diversity requirement. We've yeah. had a re diversity requirement in our major since I think 2015, and it's been a really important enhancement to our program. Thank you. Um, well, I'll go ahead and I'll get started. I'm going to start us off uh, talking about the REACH, the Re-Envisioning Ethics a Access and Community Humanities Initiative with Tim Stock. I just want to start off by talking a little bit about the background, um, kind of the history behind our collaboration. Um, this collaboration actually started in 2018. Um, and it really started because Tim and I started having conversations at the time that I was department chair regarding the overlap in our student populations. So uh, philosophy and psychology share a lot of double majors. There's also a lot of students that major in psychology and minor in philosophy or vice versa. 
And of course, we have the cognitive science minor that was developed collaboratively um, with faculty in uh, psychology and philosophy. And we were really interested uh, through our conversations with facilitating deeper connections between not only our departments, but in particular, um, between public philosophy and community psychology, which is very public facing. So I was aware, obviously, of the great work that the philosophy department's doing in the schools and in the prison systems and in other systems in our community. And um, it seemed like a good fit for a variety of reasons. And ethics in particular seemed like a natural entry point for us to begin collaborations um, for a few reasons. So ethics is a high priority area. And there's often a disconnect between professional training and philosophical ethics. Um, we tend to train students when we cover ethics. Uh, we tend to train them in very technical things, such as, uh, you know, here's the procedure for getting IRB approval, and here's what you do to protect your research participants. But it doesn't really focus on why you're making those de decisions and why you're engaging in those technical um, procedures. And it also underscores, um, it fails to underscore rather, uh, the idea that ethics is evolving and that ethical standards are coming from a value system that is potentially changing and therefore your, your technical standards will change as a result. Um, and so we developed a, I'm getting interrupted, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> You knew it was going to happen. Let me know um, if you want me to take over. I'm okay for a little bit. So we developed a transdisciplinary approach to this, and we applied for a NEH uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Connections grant. Um, the first time it was, it scored very high, but it got rejected. Um, we resubmitted, and then we were funded um, during this current academic year. So just a bit on the theoretical basis of the project, it really is um, rooted in the difference between ethics literacy and ethics agency. And we're relying on a combination of ethics, uh, philosoph philosophical literature and community psychology literature. Uh, so Miranda Fricker's epistemic injustice gives us a framework for articulating how community members are not considered fully constituent knowers of ethics. And the concept of ethical loneliness provides a framework for articulating how institutional isolation is a status quo um, and proactive engagement in forms of revisionary listening are needed. And these philosophical frameworks are very compatible and also mutually reinforcing with the call for transformative practice and community-based research and uh, particularly an attention to procedural justice. And just uh, for purposes of definition, procedural justice is where um, community members or your research participants have um, power in that process and have um, full, equal, uh, collaborative decision-making power in those processes. So the uh, theories of uh, philosophy um, nicely dovetail with a lot of the frameworks and practices of community psychology. So keeping with the public philosophy and community psychology approach, we have a community focus to our work. We're interested in learning what are the most in-demand ethical ser ethics services in the area? How can we identify priority ethical issues? So what's most important? And how can we incorporate these needs and priorities into professional development and teaching? And Tim will talk a little more about the importance of grounding uh, pedagogy in local issues and in real world issues that our students are likely to experience out in our local community and in the field. Um, but just for a little bit of a teaser, um, the, it's really important that the work is actually grounded in real world practices and principles in part because we want to move students beyond just learning technical skills or procedures, how to fill out a form, how do you, you know, here's the consent, make sure you get it, to really thinking through why those processes and procedures are happening in the first place. And having it rooted in the local community serves the additional benefit of better preparing students for placements in the community when they engage in research or internships um, or externships here locally. And hopefully we'll keep them around so that we're not having this um, drain, brain, uh, brain drain where students graduate and then leave the area. So just a bit on our process, um, we have a five uh, stage cyclical process where we work with community organizations within uh, what we've developed and called the Community Ethics Network. Um, I'm getting interrupted again. Tim, maybe you better take over. Sure. Uh, 
we both have to swap back and forth. We often both have kids in the background. So, uh, so yes, we have a five stage process and it is cyclical. So the idea is, is that all these stages are going on at the same time, but they're mutually uh, informing each other. So we're constantly in process of building a network uh, so identifying uh, leaders, partners, we have people from a wide range of um, areas in the community. So we have nonprofit organizations, for-profit businesses, advocacy groups, local government groups, faith-based groups. Um, and then that network is, shares in the information that we, um, that we develop. Uh, a narrower group of those people have participated in listening sessions, which uh, gives them a long format, open-ended ethics discussion that allows them to identify what they see as priority ethical issues or conflicts that they've had experiences with. And then we're able to see common themes. Uh, once we develop uh, that data, we then are able to do quite a lot with it because there's a tremendous amount of information in that qualitative data. And um, I'm going to say a little bit more about how we uh, we've done a pilot implementation of some of that data into a biology class, um, but we really are looking to develop course based resources that can be used to teach on campus and to change our practices uh, in in various disciplines. Uh, in terms of incorporating contemporary community ethics issues into the classroom, but then also we hope to return those by way of durable assignments uh, non disposable assignments by way of workshops by way of. Uh, focus groups and also um, even facilitating meetings and producing white papers on important issues for various stakeholders. Um, so the idea is that as we use the classroom and campus as a laboratory to discuss these ethic ethics issues, we can then return them to important stakeholders in the community. Okay. I apologize for that. Um, that happens. You're all good. Quite a lot. <laughs> Um, so the Community Ethics Network, we spent a lot of time, uh, particularly over the summer, once we got the grant, um, we really hit the ground running and then into the fall, establishing a pretty extensive network of local and regional community-based organizations and community leaders. So we have about 120 organizations currently um, participating as in our network, and these include a whole variety of stakeholders. So they include government agencies, small and large nonprofits, um, for uh, for profits and, and as well as activist groups and um, and advocacy organizations. So we do have this pretty extensive network of stakeholders, um, and the, the network, as you'll see in a little bit, they do get some community return. We'll give you some examples of that, but um, they also are engaging in the uh, listening sessions that Tim was describing, where they're. Um, basically working through a focus group where we give them a whole variety of prompts regarding ethical issues and uh, what is occurring here in our local community needs and priorities and have community uh, representatives and, and leaders discuss those in a confidential setting. Um, and uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in participating in this. So people are actually really appreciating the opportunity to talk with the not necessarily with us, but to each other in this listening session format in a confidential setting about um, some of the, the local issues that they're facing. So um, this is sort of really giving us an opportunity to develop some um, resources that can be used. We're designing them in a way that they are discipline, uh, they are not discipline specific, so that we're developing cases that really can be used in any discipline, but that we are matching content to specific classes. So. Um, in this case, uh, we were fortunate enough to have, um, so I, I should probably mention, along with the community ethics network that we've been developing uh, outside of SU, at the same time, we've been uh, running our ethics FLC uh, through that program, which is kind of operated in parallel. So we have um, really 20 faculty who are in that network and probably about 12 faculty who are engaged in weekly uh, discussion sessions about their own work, their own teaching. And then uh, the REACH initiative is able to kind of bridge the gap between what, what is the community talking about and what are the opportunities for classes on campus um, that, uh, that we could sort of situate uh, that discussion in a class. And so this is our pilot imp implementation with Jennifer Nyland in biology. Um, one of the things we discovered in a listening session, uh, like I said before, there's lots and lots and lots of data, is that um, there was there's a constant, there's a consistent theme, which is that at time, uh, nonprofit organizational leaders are in conflict ethically with their funders. So it may be that funders of a nonprofit actually have different priorities from the people who are actually running the 
nonprofit. And so that's kind of a broad bucket. And then within that bucket, there was a specific problem about messaging having to do with the COVID-19 epidemic and um, exactly what local uh, nonprofit organizations that were interested in community health should be doing to kind of educate the, their populations about COVID-19, sort of what, what they should say and what they shouldn't say. So out of that broad base of discussion, I was able to abstract a set of facts, which um, this is a standard format for a philosophy ethics case. It's the same sort of format that's used in Intercollegiate Ethics Bowl, which we have uh, that team, and we've also hosted that competition. But it gives us a nice um, fact-based format to, to essentially select and like curate a set of facts that identify a rich ethical area. Um, this case is designed to be used as a sort of one hour drop in session in almost any class. And uh, the first class that we did this in was in biology 210, uh, which is the introduction to biology for biology majors. Um, so uh, this, you know, the, to, to, I suppose we could probably advance to the next slide. Um, because the uh, there are some really key features, I think. Um, the, the early indications of this are that the community-based case uh, created a dramatically uh, enhanced uh, discussion experience for our students. So just knowing that the, the case that they were going to be discussed was one that was sourced from the local community increased engagement hugely. It led much more to a collaborative feel. People really wanted to kind of dig in and start solving the problem. They really wanted to discuss who the various stakeholders are, what their motivations were, what the right answer was. Um, and so um, uh, that was very, very successful. I, I would say that in the generation of the case, we do make some slight modifications. Number one, to preserve that confidentiality that we have in the listening sessions. We don't wanna identify any organizations or actors. Um, and then also we uh, modified the fact slightly to update it so that the case was current and dealt with the current COVID environment rather than the COVID environment from six months ago, which is where the source of the qualitative data was. So you can advance to the next slide. So this is some initial um, student feedback. Um, Michelle, did you want to talk about this or am I, am I still gone? I can talk about this. Um, right. So this is just some student feedback from the course. So this was implemented again in Jennifer Nyland's uh, site, I'm sorry, Biology 210 course. And afterwards, she had the students write reflective papers. And what you're seeing is just some of the uh, feedback that was received from those reflective papers. Um, so for instance, this one, the student says, and I'll just read the highlighted area. Sometimes I tend to think of science and humanity as separate entities when in reality they are deeply interconnected and one can't exist without the other. Because of this coexistence, I think that students learning about philosophical concepts in all majors, especially healthcare and science, it's important in making sure that college graduates are aware of how their field of study is connected to humanity. So again, these are biology majors seeing the value of humanities. Here's another. Um, another student said, we established that in order for people to feel comfortable wearing masks, they had to trust the authority that is providing the vaccine and promoting its administration. And that theme of trust, um, I think, is, is key because that's definitely a theme that's coming up time and time again in the listening sessions when um, various community leaders are describing conflicts and issues that they're working through in their community organizations. So much of that stems from um, trust or lack of trust of other stakeholders and their goals and motives. Um, this student says, this also helped me learn more about the science behind the vaccine and made me look deeper into the vaccine and see the difference between the different types of vaccines they have to get everyone who requests to take the vaccine. So again, this is indicating that not only did it give an appreciation for the humanities, but it also reinforced the biological concepts that they were learning in class. So we were actually really pleased with the student feedback. And just for comparison purposes, and partly while we were so, so pleased with it, um, is that in the fall of 2020, we had a very similar drop in, one day drop in exercise in my Psych 304 research methods class. So these are all psychology majors, again, very you know, similar in one disciplinary major course that all students are taking. Um, we used a case-based discussion and in the research methods course, we used instead, we had an 
collected much data from our listening sessions. I don't think we had collected any data. So we had used a national case. We had used the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which entailed, um, if you remember that scandal, a, a, psycholo a psychologist developing personality algorithms for uh, data collection purposes that were then used by Cambridge Analytica in, uh, in to engage in political persuasion um, over Facebook without people's knowledge. So we use that as a case study to talk about ethics and in, in the discipline of psychological research. Um, it was very similar um, in that it was uh, facilitated by Tim Stock. Actually, my Zoom cut out. He was, was running the class solo for a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we uh, emphasized uh, developing, um, identifying, and, um, developing, identifying concepts and, and developing questions and really engaging in that deep thought around why are we making the decisions that we're making? What impact do they have? Um, and how can we think through the decisions about um, our professional responsibility as either biologists or psychologists um, in these decisions and community engagement that we're doing? Um, and the, the short of it is, is that it didn't go over well in my class at all. Um, as opposed to uh, Jennifer Nyland's class where students were really engaged, they learned a lot about the concepts, uh, they felt it reinforced their biology knowledge. Um, the students in my class, and Tim, you can speak more to this, they, they tended to not really want to dig deep into the issues, the ethical issues regarding uh, the psychologist's involvement in the role of psychological research in this case, um, and they weren't very communicative. Um, so I don't know if you want to say more about your experience in the two classes, because you're the constant, Tim, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was the concept and, and it really was very exciting to have such a stark contrast in outcomes because I did, from, from my own perspective, I used the exact same format of case. I did the exact same exercises. As Michelle said, I was, I was the, cons, uh, the constant. Really, we just looked through the facts, tried to identify which concepts are underlying the facts that are ethically salient, that are, you know, we need to take account of. And then the, the exercise was to develop good questions about um, uh, you know, what is, what is the ethical issue at hand? And I think that it's interesting because with the national case, um, you know, you can't really, you can't really talk about, here's, here's the tricky thing about philosophical pedagogy and Socratic pedagogy generally, you can't tell students why it matters, right? Like I could stand up and I say, it's, it's terrible to have political manipulation, right? It's terrible to have psychology used in this way. But as soon as I've said that, you know, there's nothing else to say. I feel as if I've given the answer. And really, you want the students to be generating and recognizing that crucial initial task of being able to say, hold on, this is an ethical issue. This is not an ethical issue. Um, that recognition is so important to the process that you can't really explain why the case matters. And with a case like Cambridge Analytica, and we often find this with, with other kind of maybe buzzworthy cases in the media or um, also cases that are very important for disciplines. Maybe they capture a philosophical distinction really elegantly or something like that. Those aren't necessarily cases that students are going to dig into right away. And so we had this very, you know, same format, same type of question, same type of activity. And with the community sourced material, you had people immediately digging in. They immediately identified probably five important concepts. One of them was trust. Um, uh, and then immediately started generating questions. And we had questions about mask wearing, questions about travel, questions about who bears the responsibility. You know, should, should the airlines bear the responsibility for enforcing these rules? Should there be medical professionals in airports? I mean, the, the, the conversation was the perfect philosophical uh, conversation that was wide ranging and also produced some very tangible questions and outcomes that then the students could return to. So in terms of initial results, to me, I have the strong impression that the community source materials have made a huge difference in terms of the student buy-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think just, like, and just to emphasize what Tim said, like having them know that these are actually things people in our local community are grappling with really does impact the students in a way um, that's much more powerful and engaging than saying like, this thing happened that you may or may not have been impacted by, right? Um, so I do want to return to that fifth uh, part of that. The process is the community return. So, um, you know, the discipline of psychology, as Tim has heard me say, has a long history of data mining from communities without any return on their investment of time and energy. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're providing a return. So there are several different ways that we do that. 
And we are going to continue to grow these um, in, in coming months and years. So um, one goal is to, as we produce pedagogical tools, to encourage instructors to have their students uh, engage in uh, what's commonly called non-disposable assignments, which I'm actually a, a really big fan of. And non-disposable assignments are those assignments that have impact or value beyond the classroom walls. So things such as writing op-eds or um, doing infographics or community-based research projects or something that is a final product, which is a test of their academic knowledge, but also something that's gonna be portable back into the community. So our intent here is to um, create these pedagogical tools from the listening session data. We have about 14 hours of listening session data to, to go through and analyze. Um, to, to use to create pedagogical tools. And then those tools can then lead to non-disposable assignments that will then be returned back into the community, directly addressing the ethical issues that people are raising. Um, but we have other things too. So we don't wanna just you know, collect data from people and then leave them for, for a year as we develop resources. So we also have been um, putting out uh, quarterly newsletters. So this is an example of one of them. Um, so during the listening sessions, they um, obviously answer these questions, respond to prompts regarding um, uh, ethical topics. We also have a brief survey. We ask them some basic questions about procedures, about their organizations, about the values and things of that nature. And we take that data and we uh, give it back to them, give them the results of this in the, this is what you're looking at, it's the first page of the winter 2021 newsletter. Um, and so uh, we found that in speaking with the, uh, the members of the Community Ethics Network, they really like the, the newsletters. They find them really useful. They like the branding. They, they trust SU. <laughs> and uh, we actually had one, one person say that like the layout and just the coloring and the scheme, right, associates the association with SU was responding favorably. So we give them the newsletter with some of the data um, that we are, are finding. Um, of course, removing and keeping it anonymous. And we also um, were asked and participated in a uh, project with um, a couple of community stakeholders uh, regarding the uh, use of look back periods and criminal background checks when making decisions for housing rentals. Um, so uh, we were asked to uh, provide consultation and help kind of uh, parse out the ethical dilemmas and responsibility of different stakeholder groups um, during their process of negotiation around this issue. And uh, we actually had um, Tim Stock and Mike Koval, who's part of our REACH team through the uh, faculty learning community and on the advisory board, um, participate as a third party observer in a stakeholder meeting where they uh, discuss these issues quite openly. And I, I'm guessing somewhat contentiously. Um, so they, they, they took these the issues, parsed out um different ethical uh, areas stakeholder obligations and responsibilities and perspectives and provided uh, them back with a white paper and the feedback that we received from the stakeholder groups was that um, this was actually very useful in helping them provide um, both first off an independent third party check on the process and what they were discussing somebody to engage in accurate record keeping um, they liked that we had two representatives in there that were seen as uh, neutral and would be fair. Um, and they also really appreciated us um, parsing out the meat of the issue that they were talking about to help them better find common ground and move forward with policy decisions. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so that newsletter, the white paper, um, and uh, we hope to in the future, we've received some additional requests to serve as uh, these arbiters for ethical and community discussions that we want to um, do a little bit more of um, with more time and money. So on that note, I'm going to turn it to Tim, who will talk about our next steps. Yeah, so it's, it is very exciting. And I, I have to say there were probably about 40 different um, stakeholders across really three major groups in that housing meeting that Michelle was mentioning that produced our first white paper. And um, they represented housing focused nonprofits, also homelessness uh, centered nonprofits, as well as the city of Salisbury, as well as um, advocates and local property owners. And the, the, it was a great case for ethics because it was a case where the interests of those stakeholder groups were just radically divergent. And I'm sure that anyone that knows about um, a little bit about housing in Salisbury. Um, this is a, there's a long backstory to all of this. So part of what we were able to do, I feel effectively is just as I, Michelle mentioned the idea of neutrality, we don't even necessarily, we, we try to pay real 
close attention to that verbiage. We don't really try to position ourselves as neutral rather than just a third party that we, um, you know, we may come down on one side or another of an issue, but we are at least a third party that is disinterested in the outcome. Uh, and so, um, so that was a really great, um, a great experience. And I was very grateful to have Mike Koval support because the support of Purdue, I think made a big difference in terms of the property owners uh, ability to give feedback and have an influence on the process. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward for um, to some exciting things from the city soon coming from that. So um, in terms of our project, uh, really there are a wide range of uh, next steps that we are uh, looking towards. So the, the broadest picture is that within you know, the, the medium to short term, we're hoping to really continue to lay the groundwork for a center for ethics and social responsibility. And so that would incorporate all of these activities, but it would also provide a more durable framework for faculty and student research to really be housed in a center where this kind of engagement could, um, could have a place where we take a deep dive. We know right now that the requests that we're getting uh, requests having to do with community policing and community oversight of policing, for example, are very data heavy. They require a lot of year to year analysis of data and they require commitments that institutionally SU doesn't quite have the backbone for, right? So, you know, Michelle and I are doing this project in a lot of ways as a passion and it's been supported by the NEH, but it's hard for us to just walk into a faculty member's office and say, hey, could you do a three, three year research into local crime data, you know? So we are in a position where institutional support I think is, um, is very appropriate. And, um, and so we are, everything we do is laying the groundwork for that sort of longer term center. Um, we are uh, also engaging in uh, an application as we speak, I was just working on it this morning, to the NEH initiatives grant uh, and that grant um, is slightly different from Connections, which is the one we got. So Connections focuses on the connection between psychology and philosophy, and it really looks at the ability for that transdisciplinary partnership to generate new outcomes that each in, uh, discipline can't generate on its own. Uh, whereas the NEH Initiatives grant is really just about building capacity. And so we're really looking to develop a uh, repository for the cases that we're generating, as well as a really a community library that would allow us to generate the case, associate materials with those cases and trainings, and then turn that back to the community so that you could imagine ethics discussions could be facilitated at community meetings. They could be facilitated within organizations, within businesses. Um, they could be facilitated in classrooms across the community. Um, and so that open, open source archive is, is a big part of what we're looking at next. We're continuing to do our ethics FLC. We have an amazing, amazing group. I think I just saw Eugia uh, jump in. She's one of the group, um, but we've been uh, meeting, I think in a very humane schedule, um, uh, but at the same time, each of us has taken a deep dive into our own disciplines and talked a lot about what it would mean to do an ethics across the curriculum training program, which we're hoping to launch uh, very soon as well. And then, um, you know, the final points are really just that we are actively now disseminating the results of this into philosophy and psychology. The question actually that I had for the previous group um, that I deliberately didn't ask because I didn't want to, uh, you know, dogpile on at the end, but really we want to think a lot about what kind of impact this sort of transformative practice can have on our own discipline. I know when it comes to accelerated mentoring, there's a program called Pixie, which is philosophy in an inclusive key. And it's um, it has similar outcomes or it looks for similar outcomes as the AMP program that Yuki and Michelle have been doing. So how can you provide proactive mentorship uh, in philosophy and prepare people for philosophy grad school, which is also very white dominated. It's also very Eurocentric. Um, and so um, uh, just thinking of that kind of experience, one of the things you realize is that these sorts of programs at a certain point require the transformation of the discipline itself. And so that's where we're really engaging with, um, we just had a presentation at the Illinois Institution of Technology Center for the Study of Ethics in the Professions uh, and highlighted our work to them. We're engaging with a variety of ethics centers across the country to try to get them more invested in community-based research um, and speaking less on a professional to professional level and more on a community engaged level. Um, and then within the discipline of philosophy, for my own part, I'm very interested in continuing to publish within public philosophy and draw attention to the, the need within my own discipline to have much more access to what people in the community think of when they think of philosophical ideas like ethics. 
Um, and then the final thing, which is the final bullet point, is just that I'm very excited for this personally. I'm going to be leading our first uh, prison ethics bowl team. So our SU ethics bowl team next year will actually be scrimmaging against uh, the prisoners who, uh, the people who are incarcerated at, uh, at ECI. And, um, and that's going to be really fun. So you, we're hoping to use some of these community-based cases in that training process for the, for the local prisoners. Oops, I think I went back too far. So that's actually all we had. That was just our thank you slide. Yeah, thank um, you. So you are uh, uh, welcome to check us out on the website. Um, you can see the entire newsletters there. Um, it does need a little bit of updating and we're, we're working on that. But uh, the newsletters are up there and we also can be reached at reach at salisbury.edu, um, which we both have access to. So we welcome any questions. Thank you. I'll just also publicly say thanks to Michelle for being a tremendous collaborator in, in both of these uh, initiatives. Thank you. And thank you to both of my collaborators for um, <laughs> picking up slack when I get interrupted. <laughs> it's been an interesting <laughs> academic year. <laughs> so please unmute as you like, whatever you want to comment on or ask about. I'm thinking about what Tim was um, asking in terms of like, you know, how do we change our discipline, right? So um, I, I think, when, when I think about M students or any sex students or any like SU undergraduate students, I'm very aware of the fact that I don't know what they're gonna end up doing. And that's sort of the beauty of it, uh, that not everyone's gonna end up with the psych major, not everyone is going to actually go to graduate school in psychology and so on and so forth. And while I'd love to have a fellow counseling psychologist <laughs> in the future, um, that's just a handful of them and that's perfectly okay. And so when I think about that, you know, you never know what's going to happen and what they're gonna end up doing. And so I wanna just give them the tools to make some, not just individual changes, but macro level changes. And I think that's why um, I have definitely shifted more towards um, more of a macro level research projects that I'm thinking more about social change as opposed to individual change. I feel like my training was definitely more focused on individuals you know, doing psychotherapy, for example, and not necessarily, but then my field of counseling psychology actually does a lot of focus on multiculturalism and social justice issues, which never lends itself really well when we actually continue to focus on individual changes. And so I think that's why this collaboration with Michelle has been really fruitful for me and really rethinking about that, but also training our students who I'm not sure what they're gonna end up doing, but hopefully they'll be able to use these tools that are not just individually focused to, to do whatever. And hopefully that change is going to affect psychology and philosophy and everything else in our overall society. I, I'm really grateful for that comment. And I'm, I also, um, just the, the, the primary research that we've been doing and this data that we've collected, as Michelle mentioned earlier, has really emphasized the relationship between trust and accountability and how accountability really is a big part of transformational change, but then trust needs to be established in order for people to decide who they want to be accountable to. And I think that that's good to incorporate as a reflective process for ourselves where, you know, a part of what I've learned in working with Michelle is that the discipline of psychology can hold me accountable in part uh, to, to recognizing norms within my own discipline that I might not otherwise recognize. And, and we tend to sort of frame these collaborations as here's the great stuff we're doing at SU. And then let's, let's get, wait for the community to just kind of jump on board. Right. But, but really also doing the community work has forced me to think more about, well, who is the constituency of ethics, right? Who, if we're going to be doing work on ethics, who is that going to impact? Right. And I think the same can be said for something like counseling, which, you know, I, I feel, 
I feel a kind of maybe spiritual connection with just in the sense that our majors go on to counseling at a master's level because they might come to that from more of an investigation in terms of uh, the spirituality of it or the history of religion or, you know, an experience they had that's, that they articulate as a more philosophical experience, but that leads them in a counseling direction. So that idea of a more social and macro and holistic approach, I think that you know, that, that's a real place that we need to be accountable to, both to each other and to our community. So I'll piggyback on all this, like, like the transdisciplinary. So I keep reminding Tim that I'm like a weird psychologist because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, you know, usually work at the individual level and most uh, psychologists do. Um, but I, I think that um, the collaboration with Tim has made it even more apparent the gaps in my own training because we did get a lot of training on you know community-based research practices and participatory engagement and there was infusion of values and ethics in that but not really in a very systematic way um, and you know so so when I go to teach my own students about ethics I try to teach it to them in all of the classes that I teach but I sometimes lack the tools to do that myself because like most um, you know, people in, that are trained in psychology, I learned about ethics only in research methods, mm -hmm. right? And the rest of it was just kind of um, hidden, right? Not that ethics isn't there um, in the other courses that I took, but it's not openly discussed and addressed, right? Um, so I, I think that it's, it's highlighted for me the need to have these deeper discussions regarding values. And I think uh, particularly our, our, my own discipline of psychology, um, we do a really good job of pretending that we're neutral or pretending that we're objective and pretending that we're scientific. But in reality, everything that we do is really determined so heavily by our own personal value system and ethics down to the types of questions that we ask and the ways that we ask them and the ways that we assess them, right? The ways that we, we test them with our methods. And I, you know, I, I think that this has made apparent for me the need to um, you know, talk about transforming the discipline, make sure that that's articulated to students when we're teaching them about the theories and methods of our discipline of psychology to get them to think why you know, is this a dominant paradigm? Um, why are we choosing to ask this question in this way? And you know, how are these decisions that we're making along the way um, impacting people, right? Because they do, they do impact people. So I'm thinking, you know, like research on, you know, eugenics. Psychology has a history of ties to eugenics where there was whole lines of research that were conducted under the guise of neutrality and objectivity, but were in fact driven by a very ra racist agenda, right? And then the results of those findings were, up, were weaponized against people. Um, you know, so I think that one of the things that this project has highlighted for me, again, is my own need to do a better job about um, making it clear to students when we're learning theories that these are not just like moving them away from that scientific objectivity and really getting them to think really deeply about the choices that we're making as, as professionals or emerging professionals and how those choices are really reflective of values and how our disciplinary standards are reflective of values. And I think that this is a really great time actually for psychology in particular to be addressing these questions um, because if, uh, if anything regarding the last year with all of the challenges that it has uh, presented has uh, made um, salient, it's that we need to do a better job <laughs> of addressing these social and community issues. Um, and that you know, there, there are perspectives that our disciplines have to offer and solutions, but we're not ready there as a discipline to really implement those solutions. So I think that this is actually a really good time to engage in this transdisciplinary work. So, and thank you both to my collaborators again for stretching me to my limits this uh, <laughs> academic year, but it's not, in a yeah, good it's, way. It's, yeah, <laughs> good it's, way. Always, <laughs> it's always good, it's, it, but it, it's not always easy. You know, there are, there are times where there's miscommunications, you need to translate and all that kind of stuff. But I just wanna echo that and also say that, um, you know, I mean, two very small things, because there may be other questions, but one of them is just the idea that, um, you know, philosophy has lots of ways of defining it. People call it the love of wisdom and the, you know, all this different kind of stuff. But um, one of my preferred framings of philosophy is that it is the art of the question. It's where you, it's where you get good at understanding that question making is itself uh, a, a skill and, and one that, um, just because of the way that our university and our disciplines and knowledge tends to be organized, we don't tend to train people as well in that. 
Um, the second thing that I want to really emphasize is kind of thinking about broader macro level outcomes for the university, where, uh, as we've discovered, I mean, we were, like I said, we were just zooming over to IIT, um, Illinois Institute of Technology, to talk about uh, scientific research ethics. And a lot of these paradigms, whether it was artificial intelligence labs or biology labs or things like that, has ethics as this tertiary thing. So you have your primary content, what are you studying? Then you've got your methodology. And then as, as a third step, you say, oh, 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 and don't do anything unethical, right? Like <laughs> after we've just loaded you up with 95% of the content and sent you on this freight train heading in a certain direction, uh, you know, as a tertiary thing, we say, uh, don't, you know, pay attention to ethics. I think that, that actually the undergraduate level is the place to maybe think about this differently because our outcomes is making good critical thinkers and I think that by articulating real areas of normative difference, like areas where there are competing interests, competing frameworks, differences of principle, differences of methods in answering a question and framing a question, once students can understand why that matters, then critical thinking will follow, right? Because now that I understand that there's a big problem that I have to solve and I'm accountable for and I'm responsible for, then we can look for these you know, the kind of the white elephant of critical thinking outcomes, right? It's not just that you at the one alone, one level say, we're gonna pack in all the critical thinking and then you can solve whatever problem you want in the world. So that's just my soapbox on that. Well, I'll just jump in to say that I've been thinking about the, especially the second conversation, but the first one as well, in terms of the, the innovation, the curricular innovation that's happening here and how little it has to do with Gen Ed, right? Uh, <laughs> that the, it's, it's really exciting, it's really stimulating. And, and I think particularly as we, and, and you know, this, this kind of work certainly can fulfill Gen Ed requirements, but, but we won't be leading with that, right? I mean, I think that there's gotta be a way to market these experiences that sort of reaches beyond ticking a box, right? Because this is, this is really exciting stuff and really impactful stuff. And it, it sort of goes way beyond sort of holding court within the boundaries of your academic discipline and you know having the students come to you because they must and really sort of getting at, getting in there and and engaging them in really powerful ways I mean it's I <laughs> I don't need to touch the third rail but in, in a lot of ways I feel like some of these collaborations grow out of that that need to find a space where maybe we can step outside of these general education framework and then come back to it and think differently about what we really want to be using our classroom time for. Mm -hmm. Gia, I don't know if you can speak. I saw your note about the dentist, but she put a, a great point in the chat about reflecting on disciplinary responsibility. Absolutely. And ac accountability and training gaps. It sounds like a lot of us are acknowledging all the things we were not trained to do or know. Yeah, just a, just a quick point on that, because I think we're, we're so sort of cowed by expertise. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of thinking about that a lot lately. I was reading something in the newspaper this morning about now, now uh, there was somebody sort of arguing and somebody whose thing is over hydration. It's like, okay. but if you're writing for the public, wouldn't you want to talk about hydration in general? Say you, you need enough water, but not too much water. But if it's kind of your thing and your sort of your soapbox is over hydration, you sort of tend to push that. Um, at the expense of sort of wisdom and balance, right? And, and I think that um, especially in, in, in our world um, and thinking about tonight's event, there's just a subtle promo for tonight's um, session on anti-Asian uh, 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 racism, dismantling that. Um, that that the, the, the prompt to the faculty was to kind of relate your, your field of expertise to provide students with some guidelines in terms of thinking about racism, as opposed to specifically trying to pigeonhole an issue into your narrow field of scholarly expertise. Um, I think we're rewarded for the latter all too often, um, but in a conversation like this, clearly we bring insight and wisdom from our respective disciplines that, that ranges well beyond the specifics of our, of our scholarly expertise. Yeah, I think um, that's reminding me, Martin, of the um, IDIS 280 courses. Um, and I'm thinking especially about the course on race and um, racial identity in the US group where um, we happen to have everyone from completely different disciplines, like none of us overlapped. And each of us took a week 
and we purposefully um, put in three discussion um, weeks where we all we had was discussions in small groups and we committed to the entire semester um, attending each other's talks and everything and what I appreciated the most about that course was not just students engagement but really being able to see my colleagues at their best, like sharing their in, you know, intellectual expertise in areas, in their areas, but talking about the same topic. And then we could piggyback on each other as the week progressed on what we have discussed throughout the semester. And then students kind of seeing that like in action throughout, like it just really was a amazing experience and a lot of work, <laughs> right? A lot of work, but it, a lot of um, knowledge gained and relationships built. And that was just really amazing. But I, I know that like, you know, I don't think I'll be able to do that for all the, you know, courses that I teach, right? Like, so I think that's the, that's the dilemma in some ways that like, we may not be able to do that every single semester. We may not be able to, you know, do it in a similar format and, the logistics of it and all, um, I think is really difficult, but I certainly appreciated those interdisciplinary collaborations for sure. Well, and I think they, they help build this very, dis I, I think a distinctive and special academic community. Um, and to the degree that we can identify the practices that make those uh, things sustainable and that, that actually energize us as opposed to drain us, um, they're worth, they're worth keeping um, working at. Thanks to everyone for hanging in at the end of a very long academic year. Yeah. <laughs> to listen to our project. Yeah, so it feels like 10 academic years, doesn't it? Well, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm just sitting up here in my attic realizing, oh, I have to turn the air conditioning on. So I'm <laughs> <wilting here. laughs> well, we put a note in the chat about the program at seven. So if you have any energy left and poor Yuki and, and Martin for, you know, having to, to be on stage again, but we, we definitely appreciate you being here. And the hope and plan is that we'll be meeting in person in the fall. And we have the whole slate of Locally, presenters already signed up, including Tim again. Thank you so much. Talking about his sabbatical project. No rest for the weary, right? <laughs> Very different presentation, but yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. About com comedy and, and jest. Well done. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Maybe see you at seven. If not, enjoy your evening and this summertime weather. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.